When did liberalism become a dirty word? In today's political climate, even in cities like New York, where Democrats outnumber Republicans by five to one, conservative ideas are taking hold. I'm David Jones, president of the Community Service Society of New York, a nonprofit organization that concerns itself with issues affecting the poor. Today we're going to take a look at how we got to this place and examine the future of progressive politics and policies. We have as our guests Harvey Robbins, who served in several high-level posts in the Koch and Dinkins administrations, and Ruth Messenger, former Bur Manhattan Borough President and candidate for mayor. Welcome to the Urban Agenda. Okay. Well, Harvey, how did we get to this uh, position where you can't even mention liberalism or being progressive without being shoved to the side? Uh, I think uh, we got too comfortable, and we didn't think that um, uh, anyone or any new ideas were going to challenge what uh, we believe to be right, correct, purposeful, um, and um, we lost the tension that I think is necessary in looking at programs that failed um, and holding on to um, policies um, that should have been reviewed, revisited, evaluated, mm -hmm. and changed. Um, and without that tight discipline, um, we gave away um, the debate in the city. Ruth, what do you think? Well, I think that that's true. I think that um, we didn't look at the programs that we were spending taxpayer dollars on to say which ones work and which ones don't. This city actually has an appalling record through several administrations of looking to see what it pays its money for. It does that within city government, right. and it does that when it give con gives contracts. It seems not able to are not willing, hasn't been willing to take the time or to, or to use the muscle, because obviously it can make some discriminations to say, this is a great program we're funding, which means, of course, that we would like to recognize it, we'd like to advertise it, we'd like to replicate it, right. and we can replicate it if we simply do away with these programs that aren't accomplishing their purpose. Having not done that, I think government sent the message to people that it was perfectly happy with how it was doing. But people weren't perfectly happy, right. and so, they rebelled, and very often they rebelled against sort of what they thought they had and went looking for any alternative without really thinking through what they were choosing. Mm -hmm. what, what about the racial characteristics of what we have? How much has that played into it? This is a city which is, is sharply divided along racial lines now. How did that play, uh, in, in your view? It clearly had some impact on uh, liberalism and progressive politics being as seen as too much to leaning to one group over another. Well, I, I, think, um, I think what you're asking, or at least how I would answer it, is that um, we got too involved in what I call identity politics, mm -hmm. where um, each group was saying, it's now my turn. Um, to get a piece of the action. Um, and in doing so, um, what um, candidates and people that were elected to office um, became frozen because they were uh, not sure about what they would do or say or actions to take for fear of alienating one group or another. What should have taken place, and again, part of this discipline that I think we lost, is that um, if we looked at what the root um, values of the Democratic Party was. Um, it was basically to serve the working class. Mm -hmm. um, and Clinton, by way of example, s led with um, a health care program that said we're going to serve the working poor. Had he taken the position, I believe, that we are going to extend universal health care for everyone and not made it a poor person's program, I think there would have been a lot more receptivity um, in selling it. So what we did, we, we sort of sliced and diced ourselves up. Instead of looking at the issues of wage stagnation, the loss of health insurance, the issues of failing schools, um, and the issues of uh, the lack of job growth in the city, which would have raised everyone rather than, right. again, looking at the identity politics question. Yeah, well, on, on, on the one hand, I agree with Harvey. That is, I agree that we did not look at um, what was really on people's minds. And, and we stopped designing programs that really said, all right, what do people most need? They're concerned about their economic security. They're concerned about their physical security. And they're concerned about their mobility. Right. And, that, that, and, and really design programs there. And that is what the Democratic Party 
ought to be about, and I think it wandered away. I guess I tend to think that a little too much is made of this, we fell into identity politics. Um, the fact of the matter is I'm not sure we, we fell into it at all. That is, I think that there were still too many people in power who simply didn't look at who lived in the city and what the city had become. Now, I'm not arguing for a minute that this group or that group at bottom wants something different. In fact, I think if you do some talking, you discover that basically those concerns, jobs, education, a home, health care, are on the minds of the vast majority of New Yorkers and actually the vast majority of Americans. But how you talk about it, where you talk about it, mm -hmm. says to people you are or aren't right. talking to them. And I don't think we did enough of talking to the groups that are becoming the majority in New York City. One of the linchpins of progressive politics, at least in my lifetime, has been the union movement in America. Clearly, the union movement is going through some dramatic and seismic shift. And it clearly played itself out, at least to some degree, in, in, uh, in electoral politics in New York. Where, where is uh, the organization around working people going? How is that going to play on progressive? Well, I, I think that uh, the union movement is one of the great oxymorons in, in New York City. <laughs> um, They're not moving. I, I, exactly. I, I think that if we look back historically on the union movement, um, it was a very progressive uh, force for change about uh, child labor and a number of issues regarding working conditions. In New York City, what I believe has happened over the last 30 or 40 years is that every contract that was negotiated um, was about getting more and more for, for labor. Um, and now we're in a situation where work rules have been negotiated that are so costly and so onerous that the workday continues to get sliced to fewer and fewer hours per day that each person is working. Mm -hmm. um, and the unions said, whatever we have gained, we will never give up. Um, that is neither progressive nor enlightened. It's what the conservatives took us apart on. It, it basically is, is one in which um, I am looking for leaders to say that um, our workers ha contribute enormously to the city, but representing 50% of now the city's budget of $34 billion. Um, when fire department people um, get overtime for traveling to go to another house when somebody calls in sick, and 19 out of 24 hours a day in a firehouse is spent idle, um, there's something terribly wrong with the issue of productivity. When failing teachers, it takes, it takes a shorter time to build the George Washington Bridge than it does to take a disciplinary action against a failing teacher. Um, and all that happens is that teachers and principals who have failed continue to fail and continue to be passed along to another, to another school. Well, we've, we've found a community service society, it's even more deadly than that. They end up being passed along to areas with the highest concentrations right. of poverty oh, right. and further destabilize poor neighborhoods and the chances of poor kids. So it even, in some ways, is worse. I, if they sent them to Bronx Science, maybe that would help. <laughs> actually, because at least I'd get something at Prospect Heights High School, being a Brooklyn well, person. Well, I mean, the thing so. is true. There, there's no, there, are no, um, there are no, really almost no standards for productivity that right. make any sense to the average person. Very often, by the way, don't make sense to the average worker. It's very hard in many of the civil service systems that the city has set up for the individual worker to figure out how he or she can get more attention, um, can get rewarded for good work. Um, and so the system neither neither has rewards or san nor sanctions that, that make most sense to the average person. I just want to add to that because there are two sides to this, um, you know, conventionally, right. labor and management. And, and we could sit here, and certainly it did get played out in the election. There were lots and lots of unions that put their next contract and their next immediate ongoing negotiation with the mayor ahead of moving their members, choosing candidates, uh, paying attention to uh, broader issues. Right. But I, I want to be sure that we keep some of the focus, Harvey, on the management. I mean, mm -hmm. it is the city that is management. And the city has shown a terrible capacity to kind of roll over to the union expectations that nothing will get changed. And so you have people run for office talking about changes. Um, and then in office, um, they agree to drop all of that. Right. And there's no focus on any of that. And the notion is sort of you keep working. You don't make too much trouble. Don't be a movement. 
and we'll give you what, what you most need. Um, we have actually, in, in this last, in the first Giuliani administration, there was a contract negotiated. Now, it was a terrible contract from the workers' point of view, in my judgment. It said to workers, we know the cost of living is going up. You won't see any new money for 24 months. It was also a terrible contract from the city's fiscal point of view because it promised huge increases actually starting this year at a point at which the city had no way of knowing whether it was going to have the money right. for those increases. Um, but it also dropped every single issue of negotiation on productivity or mm. changes in but, performance but or increase in standards. Aren't we making the case uh, for privatization that the conservatives come up with? Uh, they say, you know, you've got a bloated uh, city bureaucracy. It's clearly the unions uh, are not uh, responsive to change and cost cutting, and we should privatize. Isn't that the solution here? I mean, uh, I have a different percentage uh -huh. point of view, particularly on public hospitals, but how, how do you, uh, you know, you've made the case, basically. Well, I think, first of all, I, mean, I think, no, from my point of view, that's not the case. First right. of, it ignores several things. First of all, it ignores the fact that there is a difference between the public sector and the private sector, and it's the job of the city to keep that difference in mind and work it into everything it does, policy, program, budget, and labor right. negotiations. Second of all, David, those people who argue it, want people to believe, and frankly, they've been quite successful so far, that somehow the private sector works perfectly. Well, first of all, it doesn't work perfectly. But second of all, very often, right now, certainly in the healthcare field where you know, the private sector is making its money by squeezing workers. And in fact, it would be terrible for the city if large numbers of these services were simply given to someone else to do with, essentially then, a rush for the successful bottom line. Mm -hmm. And with the private company that was doing jail saying, you know, four in a cell and cut the wage of the correction worker in half. And the private company that was doing health care saying, um, you can't come in here unless you can show us you have some form of coverage right. because we can't afford it. The problem is, and it goes right back to Harvey's first answer to your question, too many people in government have said, well, since that's a bad alternative, the status quo is well, fine. It can go on. But I think, I think yeah. there's another way to approach it, and right. that would be, again, using a word that I mentioned earlier, was that we have to keep the tension there. And the way that that happens is through letting work be competitively bid. Absolutely. And through that, you, I believe you will get negotiated or renegotiated work rules and productivity because labor will want to retain that work. Right. And unless that is there, seriously, a serious competition and a serious tension that the privatization movement will continue to go. But Absolutely. we're going to need to have leadership in government that's going to say we have to change the dynamic. Right. Right. And let's, let's, just to be very specific, because this is something I talked about in the campaign, it seemed to get a lot of people anxious, but it was very specifically, the city has an obligation to take pieces of city work, park maintenance, the operation of a health clinic, and mm -hmm. say, we're going to bid this competitively. Now, we have a couple of ground rules. So that's so you right. don't get into people changing practices in ways that are not in the city's interest. A certain number of people must be treated. Um, a certain standard of health care or performance must be maintained. And I would argue a certain wage level must be respected. Right. But we want to hear from people who think they can do this more efficiently than it's now right. being done. And we include the union or unions that are now involved on site in that request. We would like their bids. I'll tell you, my experience in 20 years in government is you can go out and talk to a huge number of the people who work for the city and just say, how could the work of your division or your agency be done more efficiently? They've got they know. a thousand answers. Yeah. And if they had to bid to put mm -hmm. those into play, you really would be stimulate some union democracy and some competitiveness right. and the tension that just, Harvey's talking about. Just shifting a little to another issue. I mean, part of the, what we're hearing is one of the reasons you can't get much traction on certain progressive issues is clearly the boom in the economy. Um, how stable are we, in your view, in terms of how New York's economy is, is doing? I've heard uh, some reports, some from my own agency, looking at the problem that if we do hit a recession, we're in for quite a roller coaster here. Uh, for particularly poor people, but also for city government. What, what's your take on this? Sir? 
Well, um, I don't pretend to uh, go beyond the five boroughs in terms yes, of... Yes, that's right. <laughs> we don't, this, we don't. Is, this is global economics. Yeah, right. Um, well, we are a global city, we're told. Um, but um, it's, uh, for me, it's, a, it's um, a question that I don't know that I'm prepared to, to answer. I know what the consequences it will be, but I haven't any... I can't speak to the, the instability or when or, or mm -hmm. how it would, um, you know, it, it would take place if and when it happens, uh, the repercussions of it, uh, I'm sure Ruth and I could speak on, but maybe you want to take a shot at the global well, piece of no, that. No, no. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't profess to know the answers. I do think we have to pay attention, more attention than we have as a city to what's happened. We talk very glibly about being a global city, about the economy having become global. Now that's true, and in many ways, first of all, it's inevitable. I mean, it's a consequence of the communications and technology revolutions, and undoubtedly it has huge benefits. But it makes life any place in this country a great deal more volatile than it was before, and nobody can make a great case that we avoided, you know, booms and busts before. Right. So, so we're sitting right now, I think I, I'd like to look at it from a slightly different point of view, and that's, that is, indeed, it did interfere with or it influenced the election. People mm -hmm. who are feeling good economically have very little reason to make changes. I knew that going in. But here we are with a great moment in the city's economy, judged by all kinds of indicators, including the fact that the city right now is taking in more money each year in taxes than it anticipated. So is the state. But immense, unsolved, unaddressed problems None of the surplus, or almost none of the it's surplus, is being used to address those problems. And some of those problems, like 9.3% unemployment, are occurring at the same time as we have an economic boom. So I think the one thing I assume we would agree on is that the consequences to an economic upheaval in, in, in possibly all halfway around the world would not only affect Americans and New Yorkers, but would have to have a very disastrous and negative effect on the quality of life in the city very quickly. Harvey, you've been working on right. some of the issues around uh, is the boom actually trickling down? Right. I shouldn't use that. <laughs> but, right. but. I, I think that, um, I think Ruth is right, um, and I, the only thing I would add is that um, we had some choices to make over the last couple of years when we saw um, Wall Street um, really uh, taking off and that is the choice of job creation and not being so beholden to Wall Street as basically the single engine. Um, and the investment in a number of areas um, in the city's infrastructure, for one, uh, would have um, solidified for another generation um, investments um, in schools and in housing and in rail links um, that would make us more competitive that wouldn't require us to be so dependent upon Wall Street. Um, and we chose not to do that. In fact, um, the failed practices of Koch and Dinkins were perpetuated by Giuliani uh, with corporate welfare. Mm -hmm. um, Giuliani could have come in and said, you know what, I'm not going to be a business as usual uh, mayor. We're going to end corporate welfare. Instead, he gave $75 million this summer to Bear Stearns. Bear Stearns claiming morally they didn't ask for it, so I don't know how they got it, but that was their claim. At the very moment that Bear Stearns awarded $87 million to five people in the firm. Now, it seems to me somebody ought to, somebody ought to have said, time out, that greed has moved to a point <laughs> where $75 million would do two things if I were mayor. $10 million would go to the food pantries and soup kitchens, right. and we would be able to say in the city we have a hunger-free city, and the balance would go to seven days a week library service, 10 hours a day. That would serve every community and every family um, in the city. Now, that's a choice to be made. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I would, I, would, I would argue it two different ways, if I could. One is, um, I think uh, Harvey's absolutely right and a, a serious um, stopping business as usual, ending most of these corporate tax breaks, and making the clear argument, here's the alternative use for this money um, um, in a way that meets the needs of more people. But I guess I would also argue it, because I've, I've, I've been through the campaign, I've been borough president, to the extent that there are going to be negotiations with businesses, we don't ask for anything. It's the most astounding set of discussions. So let's assume 
X million dollars to Bear Stearns. And that's a bad case because they say they didn't ask for it. Well, let's take somebody who said, it? well, I'm not Can we write in? You know, right, just, right, just call if you're a big enough firm. Um, the Community Service Society is moving to Newark. You didn't. Okay. Um, uh, but, but let's assume that we're in a tough negotiation, that we are clearly competing with New Jersey or Connecticut for some particular business. And the business tells us, here are some of the problems we have in staying in New York. Here's what we need. I know, this is not a hypothetical. I know from my work as borough president that you can say to those businesses, okay, but here are some conditions on that money. Here's how we want you to allocate those jobs. And the businesses are happy to respond they see it as good business. Mm -hmm. When I fought the mayor over the Pathmark on East 125th Street, I said Pathmark was getting all kinds of low interest loans for doing business north of 96th Street. Mm -hmm. Existing law, it wasn't even a separate negotiation. It really was their due. But we were helping them to move into that site. I said 75% of the jobs at every single level up to manager to people from the neighborhood. The only question was, Give us the community group mind. that will screen the people. Mm -hmm. And they have now, they've broken ground. Right. They're starting hiring because they want to train community people at some of their other stores so they will, in fact, be able to put them in the day the store opens because it's good business right. for them. It's interesting. I, I was at a meeting with uh, some of the leadership of the New York City Partnership, and we were going around just at the eve of how many jobs they'd be able to support uh, for welfare to work. And at least at the highest level, very few, because certain of the financial sector virtually have a handful of people they can put in their file rooms and in their messenger operation. But basically, you need manufacturing and other broad scale uh, job creation to really hire people with yeah. limited skills. And that Bear Stearns, I, if they hire five welfare to work, I'd be surprised. Right. But I don't know if anyone asked them. No, see, I think that's the point. First of all, no one asks them. And, right. and, um, but second of all, David, I'd take it a step further, and Harvey was certainly right before. Part of the answer to this, the persistent unemployment, is diversifying our economy, which government does have a hand in, right. and another part of it is improving our schools, which is government's responsibility. But let's go to what you said. It's important that you were having that discussion, but all of those corporate leaders need to be pushed, and around the table discussion is not enough. For example, whoever it is who may indeed have only five slots that he, and it's usually a he, he can is. immediately <laughs> imagine, well, now, what's the reason for that? Well, I'll tell you, among the reasons for that, they have contracted out their office cleaning and maintenance. Right. They've contracted out their food service. But that just requires, and it's not easy, another step. Then you say to them, okay, when your lease, let me just say hypothetical, when your lease for food service in your building, in your cafeteria, expires, would you be willing to enter into a partnership with the Community Service Society, which is overseeing the hiring of the graduates of Park West High School, which mm -hmm. is a food service high school. And would you indeed, my office, the Manhattan Borough President's office, clear fact, for every reception we held, we did one of two things, usually both. We asked for food contributions right. from uh, various restaurants, and we went to Park West and took advantage of their That's catering service. Okay, we're, the, the cards are going to be reshuffled now, obviously, in New York. There's term limits. There, everyone, there's a long list of people already kicking off formal and informal campaigns. What would be the sort of components of uh, a, a progressive agenda? What, what should we be looking for if that's our interest? Schools that work. Schools that work, okay. I, Harvey? I would, there, I, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, and that for each of these right. things that we'll suggest, there are clear components, and you, you can identify them. I mean, schools at work mean standards for kids, for teachers, and for principals. Right. They mean a different level of school-based budgeting and school-based decision-making, a different level of parent involvement. Um, but you need to be very serious about those things and spell out how you get them and the dollars that you need to achieve them. You think the UFT them. will agree to all this? Um, as you point out, as government is changing, we're either going to set agendas or how to make the kinds of changes that I think we've all agreed we made too few of over right. the last two decades, or I think as a city we're going to find ourselves falling mm -hmm. further and further behind. I, I, th I, I think we need to start with where we are now, which basically has lowered the, ex the expectations of the people in the mm -hmm. city. The, mm -hmm. the mayor has done a masterful job right. in basically saying there are 
um, that safe streets, unlitted sidewalks, and obedient, obedient uh, pedestrians <laughs> are the three <laughs> things that um, we, all that we could pretty much expect, expect. for from government. Um, we'll watch Wall Street and hope that it continues to, you know, to perk along. But the things that he said that he that he has his hands on, right. those are his three choices. I think that is shallow, and I think it really undermines people in the city and what um, government, in your term earlier, an activist government might might look like. For me, the issue of enforcement um, needs to continue. It shouldn't stop with crime in the streets. It should continue in crime in in the boardrooms right. and crime with illegal dumping that contractors do and there are 2,000 sweatshops in this city it's maybe growing. more the fire department sits and does nothing it should be inspecting and working with the state labor department and rooting out not pedestrians that that jaywalk but people that exploit people and put them in very dangerous mm -hmm. work settings. There's one example of expanding the definition of enforcement. The second would be landlord abuse. How many people are living in apartments, apartments where yeah. there's no heat, there's no hot water, there's faulty wiring? What I would call for is using the blue room every day. For that and, kind and of... people would be humiliated. <laughs> I believe that that is about the only thing that is going to bring about a change in practice. practice. And I just want to just I, I agree with close. that. Oh, agree with that completely. Just a quick point there, and that is, even in this area, the mayor has moved away from standard previous expectations. Right. The city is basically privatizing enforcement, not even giving it to a private enforcement group, but letting people self-certify that their buildings don't have any violations. And we're beginning to see the bricks that fall from the roof, the bricks right. that fall from the scaffolding that are the consequence of not doing serious well, enforcement. Well, we can't do everything at this, uh, this, <laughs> this show, but I'd, I'd like to thank you both for uh, participating in what has to be round one, <laughs> uh, I think, of a long discussion. It's not easy being a progressive in today's New York, but there are still many of us working towards a better future. New York City has too many social and economic problems to address without an activist government and a safety net. While conservative ideals seem to have the upper hand at this moment, this too shall pass. In time, the conservative program to privatize governmental functions and divert tax monies away from individuals in need to solely fund business incentives will create problems that even the disaffected middle class will not be able to ignore. It is then that a revitalized progressive agenda will come to the fore. This is David R. Jones saying goodbye for the urban agenda. To comment on the urban agenda or for more information on CSS, contact Community Service Society of New York, 105 East 22nd Street, New York, New York, 10010, area code 212-254-8900.